Okay, hello everybody. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me okay? You can hear me, but are you really listening? <laughs> what if I could prove to you that none of you are actually really listening? So today I'm going to share with you some thoughts and ideas about listening. So I don't ask that you agree with all or any of this stuff. I say, if there's nothing in this for you, then disregard it. And let's move on. Sound fair? Okay, cool. So, simple question. What does that say? One, two, three. Merry Christmas. Yes. No, it doesn't. It actually says, Mufkus <laughs> Gajujimuth, whatever that means. Um, and that, that is a, an example of one of our cognitive biases. And I think it was Jim Carrey who said, your eyes, like your ears, in, in conjunction with your, your brain, are not just viewers, the projectors, projecting a, a second narrative over what you see and hear. So I think the point here is for testers to be aware of those biases and those filters. You've got a lot of filters. You've got a lot of biases. Um, these filters create our reality and help us choose what we pay attention to. And one that's particularly important for testers, I think, is this one at the bottom, so intention. So what is your intention when testing? Why do you test? Let's take a minute to, 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 just to think about why you test. Because that's what you're focusing on naturally as you test, and you'll get what you focus on. Yeah, to just, just consider why are you testing something? Why are you testing? So yeah, I'll leave that for you to answer yourselves. Maybe we'll come back to that one. That's a cognitive bias codex. And what strikes me from that is that there's a heck of a lot of cognitive biases you've got there, and a lot of things that can kind of trip you up. And maybe with listening, hopefully what we're going to kind of go through is some of these cognitive biases over to the left-hand side there. Too much information or not enough meaning are some of the kind of the biases, particularly that are kind of suitable for, for listening and we, the, the traps that we sort of fall into. So I'm not going to go into that in any more detail, but that's just a useful tool to look at those biases and, and think about what you might be falling into when you're testing or when you're coaching or, or any of those sort of things. So how do we listen? We listen with filters, with biases. You also listen in pattern recognition. And that should have been a pattern that you all recognised. Did you recognise that one? Yeah, that's a Renee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was what we were trying to provoke in you there—a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of a little bit of action. And so, in psychology, pattern recognition describes a cognitive process that matches information from a, sti from a stimulus with information retrieved from memory. And then, what Royd nearly did there was ap apply some apply some thinking and a decision based on that information and memory. So that's something we, we learn from a very early age to distinguish between those patterns. And we distinguish, distinguish between familiar and comforting patterns and things that are scary and different. And that maybe was an example of something that was scary and different, something that provoked a response. So another example of that would be your name. If I said Royd, David, Gwen, Peter, Maybe you would look up and stop look, playing on Twitter. <laughs> Maybe you would recognize that. Um, and in the 1950s, a, a chap called Colin Cherry um, observed something, first recognized the cocktail party effect, that you would recognize your name in a very crowded, um, in a very crowded area with lots of people talking. You'd, there'd be a conversation you weren't listening to. You'd, you'd hear that pattern of your name, and then you'd suddenly become aware of that conversation. So yeah, we listen in pattern recognition. On the next slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a slide full of O's, zeros, and one Q. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put your hand in the air at the point at which you can see the Q. Yeah? Everybody understand? OK. So find the Q and hand in the air when you can see it. Yeah, so pretty quick, pretty quick. OK. So next time, I'm going to give you a slide full of Q's and one O. And I'd like you to put your hand in the air when you can find the O. Still going, still going. There's some people who haven't found it. There's a, there's a chap there. Have you found it? 
It is. Where is it? It's there. It's there. So you can, you can see that's, that's a very simple demonstration that it's much easier to, to find the presence of something than the absence of something. And it's a, it's a problem called feature search asymmetry. Um, and it shows that, yeah, we can, pr we can more easily find the presence of something than the absence of something. And that's particularly important for testing and I think demonstrates one of the givens of, of testing in that you can't prove the absence of problems. Testing only proves the presence of problems. So we listen in pattern recognition. We also test in pattern recognition. Differencing. So if everyone's really, really quiet for a moment, let's just, just listen to what we might have been ignoring. So there's a hum somewhere, isn't there? Can't tell where it's coming from. There's a car that you've probably just been ignoring. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going on in the background. The world is very, very noisy, and you're ignoring it. You would naturally ignore constants. You even ignore stochastic sounds, such as birdsong, or the, the cars outside, something that isn't constant. So what might you be ignoring in testing? <coughs> what about test automation? Anybody seen any bad test automation that fails regularly? Yes, a few people. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a signal-to-noise problem. <coughs> we've got a lot of tests that fail. We've, we've got noise there of those failing tests. And when there's a signal that we, need to, that we need to sort of take action on, we need to write a bug report, we maybe need to go and talk to a developer, it becomes hard to find that signal-to-noise. It becomes hard to find that signal when you've got all that noise, all those failing tests in the background. Yeah, and so we probably spend a lot of time working out whether, thing is, whether things are actually a problem. And I think, so the, the point there is, is with that automation, it, it's really tricky to find the, to find the problems, signal-to-noise ratios. And I think why I put the trees up here is because I think it's, it's like trees in a forest falling all the time and you're unable to hear when a really, really important tree, maybe a tree that has a tree protection order on it, is, is falling. <coughs> Okay, so how do we listen? We listen with filters, with biases that create our reality. We listen to patterns. We ignore constants. We listen indifferently. When I was researching for this talk, I, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about the skills of listening, but I didn't really find anything that sort of sat well with me about the skills of how we listen. And, but what I did find was listening modes. And this is my interpretation of a couple of these listening modes. So critical listening versus empathetic listening. Who's ever worked for a boss or for a company where it, it's kind of felt every answer was a no initially? It's frustrating, isn't it? Um, it? It does have its place in testing, though. Critical listening, critical thinking is important in testing. Part of a tester's job and a role. Empathetic listening, so paying attention to someone with emotional identification, compassion, feelings, seeking to understand. Both critical and empathetic listening have their place. Definitely interesting. Passive versus active listening. So passive listening, listening quietly without responding. Maybe a coach. There's several types of silence. Listening actively, listening actively questioning being highly present, involved in the conversation. So again, both are really important. Coaches, counsellors tend to be more <coughs> passive, maybe. But then vary that in, in terms of, vary that and occasionally move towards active listening. Another listening mode, and I'm definitely very, very guilty of this, and I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story to demonstrate it, is Reductive versus expansive listening. So I have, uh, I have two children, and my first daughter, Martha, she's two and a half now, had colic, and she was really, um, she, was, she had a really tough first few months. And um, she wouldn't sleep for more than an hour, an hour and a half. And my, my wife used to sort of get, obviously get really, really stressed out by this. Sleep deprivation is, is a horrible thing. And... Yeah, it was a really tough time for us. And 
she would she would kind of say, well, this blinking child, it won't sleep. We've tried everything. And she, she just wanted to whinge about it. And it was very frustrating for her. And I would listen reductively. So in this case, I would be saying, oh, well, I could, I could take her tonight. I could just go in the front room on, on, the, on the bed or whatever, on the sofa. I could give her a bottle. So I was proposing my <coughs> solutions. And this really wasn't what she wanted, I don't think. And so the minute I, I kind of started researching this and listened more expansively, so just listened for the journey rather than listening for and proposing my solutions, it really revolutionized that kind of situation for us. Um, yeah, so men tend to listen more reductively than women. Women tend to listen more expansively. Bit of a generalization, but um, yeah. So, yeah, what was I listening for there? I was trying to solve the problem there and then, suggesting ideas, solutions. Really wasn't the right listening mode to be in. If I'd evaluated my listening mode, maybe I wanted to move more expansively, and that's something I, I try and do these days. It seems to really help for me. So, fellas, if you're going to take anything away from this, maybe look at that listening mode. When do you need to be more expansive? When do you need to be more reductive? And again, I think the point here is, both modes are important. Um, you wouldn't want to always just be listening expansively, or you wouldn't want to always just be listening very reductively. Um, the second listening modes kind of model that I found, and I like this one a little bit less, if I'm honest with you. It's a slightly older one. It says that we can be in any two of these at any one time. Um, and it's, I think it's from sort of the late 80s. So people-centric listening, time-centric listening, context-centric listening and action-centric listening. And again, men tend to be in one of these three zones more than the people's zone, and women tend to be in the people's zone a little bit more. Um, yeah, and maybe the kind of the action listening is a little bit analogous to the reductive listening. So yeah, a couple of models there. Steve, what's the time-centered one? Um, so time-centric is... It would be someone who was thinking about the time that was being involved in the conversation and maybe wanting to get away. Um, probably, be, probably be the best description of that. So how do we listen? Critical versus empathetic, passive versus active, reductive versus expansive. And there's probably a whole load more of those listening modes out there. Um, and then the second model was people who listen for action, people, time, and content. Being aware of those modes, I think, for me, has been quite a powerful thing and trying to adjust my mode. For example, when I'm coaching, how, do I need to be more passive or do I need to ask more questions? And one other thing I came across when I was researching was a few failure modes. So Stephen Covey's um, listening to respond, not actually listening, switching off from what the speaker's saying and then kind of just putting your, your thoughts out there. Losing the kind of the train of the conversation a bit. Uh, as an ex-performance tester, I wanted to find out a little bit out about our auditory limits, and particularly with the, the little listening to respond thing. And this, my search started with this chap, me high, see high, sent me high. That's definitely how you pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> sorry if I've mispronounced that, me high. Uh, and he's done a lot of research around our auditory senses. He's got a great TED talk about flow, and uh, that's really worth a watch. Um, and his research led him to conclude that we could deal with about seven, give or take two chunks of information at any time. And when you combine this with a chap called John Orms, his conclusion that we operate in attentional units of one eighteenth of a second, so seven times 18 is 126, I think, 126, that's right. Um, that's 126 bits per second, he thinks, that we could potentially take on. That would be our auditory limit. That was his sort of first stab at it. But he also estimated that one person talking was about 40 bits per second. So that would, that would kind of mean that maybe we could listen to three people at once. It doesn't really make sense to me. I, I, I can't listen to occasionally one person, one person at once. Um, so, yeah. Then I found the research of this chap, Julian Treasure. And again, he's got some really great TED Talks, and he's got a really good book as well. And, and he revised 
Mihai has seven chunks of information down to three. So that would be 18 times three, and that would be 54. If you took Mihai's estimate of 40, so yeah, you could listen to one person, but may, and maybe a little bit more. That sounds a little bit, little bit better to me. It seems to make sense. So with, yeah, and Julian also talks about the brain being like a big hard drive and our auditory senses being like RAM. And that RAM and that short-term memory is also used for other things. It use, it's used for pattern recognition, concepts, combined symbols, and imagined words. So that 54 bits is potentially used for more than just, just listening. So probably in conclusion to that, listening to respond could be a capacity problem caused by our limited auditory capacity. So we, we can't simply stick in some more RAM and, and increase our auditory capacity, but maybe being aware of, of that limit that we've got on, on our auditory capacity might mean we give more attention to listening properly. Now, as I researched, I, I, I thought about people who listen really well, so counsellors and coaches. And my coach at the time, Jeff, who spoke last week, last month, uh, recommended me a book by Nancy Klein. And this is a quote from that book, Time to Think. She believes that everything we do depends for its quality on the thinking we do first, and our thinking depends on the quality of our attention to each other. And in her book, Time to Think, she goes through the, she, she talks through the ten components of creating a thinking environment. <coughs> so these are the components. So attention. Attention. So probably the most important component in a thinking environment. It's the key to creating it, in fact. Genuine interest without interruption. But attention isn't, isn't enough. Without ease, where's ease, ease? Without ease, we probably can't create a thinking environment. Have you ever had, say, a manager or a colleague over your shoulder <laughs> when you're trying to do something and you just feel a bit pressured and it, suddenly you, you lose the ability to type? Maybe we've not got ease there. Appreciation. So Nancy doesn't simply promote appreciation for appreciation's sake. It's a balanced ratio of appreciation to challenge. So I think five to one she talks about. Five appreciations to one challenge. So feelings. When feelings start to show themselves, thinking very quickly stops. If we, if we acknowledge feelings then and with, with ease, then those feelings will subside and good thinking can resume. Information. So a key one for testers. As testers, we don't want to be called quality assurance. We don't want to be stood by the gate shaking, thinking, oh my God, if I let this into production, they're going to fire me. We want to be information providers. We want to test things, provide that information. So we need to provide accurate and relevant information, key skill of a tester. Incisive questions. So everything we do as humans is driven by assumptions, those biases. I showed you the, the cognitive biases chart. There's a huge amount of those things. So incisive questions seek to challenge those assumptions, those filters, those biases that we have. So testers ask great questions, and it's a skill of your testers to, to ask questions that other people don't ask, to ask incisive questions. And, yeah, massive part of the value of a tester for me is how they ask those questions. Okay. Ten components of a thinking environment. So in conclusion, how do we listen? We listen with filters. We've got biases. We listen in differencing. We listen in pattern recognition. We've got varying different listening modes. It's important to be aware of where you're listening from and alter that mode to where you think it's appropriate. We've got a limited auditory capacity. And testers create great thinking environments. So these are all the people I need to say thank you to, really, for their research and their work without that work those guys, um, there wouldn't be any talk, really. Yeah, so thanks to those people. So and I'd like to leave you 
with a mnemonic. So it's listen. Look and listen. So only 7%, and it might surprise you, only 7% of the meaning is conveyed by the words used. The other 93% is in the non-verbal stuff, your facial expressions, your tone of voice. So bringing this back to testing and performance testing, for example, are you, are you only taking that 7% into account? Are you only looking at, for example, the response times from the system? Are you not seeing the body language of how the system performs, the resource utilization stats? Are you not looking at the login? Understand the meaning of your, of your system. So look and listen, not only to people, but also to your systems that you're testing. Interrupt. So Nancy would say it's an, it's an act of violence to interrupt in a, in a thinking environment, so don't interrupt. Summarise. So what I'm hearing is, it's a key phrase for me, so we've talked about, play it back to somebody. Test or check your understanding. Testing versus checking is an interesting debate in the testing community. So test your understanding. So what I'm hearing is, is that right? Test your understanding. Make sure you're on the same page. Evaluate. Evaluate your listening position, your listening mode. Get in the right one. Neutralise your feelings. Listening isn't about you. Neutralise your feelings. So I'd like to finish by asking you to join me in listening better, being more aware of your listening mode, creating thinking environments, making your business analysts thinking better, your scrum master, your tester, whoever, you, the people around you at home, your children, your wife, your partner. Make their thinking better. Yeah, so I invite you after this, ask somebody a question. Look and listen to how they're responding. Don't interrupt. Summarise what you've heard. Test your understanding. Evaluate your own feelings. E evaluate your listening position and neutralise your feelings. So. Thank you very much for indulging me. Um, that's all I've got.